Thank you. Thank. I feel honored that all of you are here, and I want to thank Katarina for inviting me here again. But I'm going to start out by sharing something personal and confidential. And Katarina should stay here for this. A couple of weeks ago, she said to me, Michael, yes, you paint, but you don't make fine art. Now, to some artists, that would be like taking a paintbrush the size of a telephone pole and stabbing them in the heart with it. So then I went home and I said to my wife, Katerina says I do not make fine art. And my wife said, of course not. <laughs> you, you are an outsider. And I reflected when I was in elementary school and high school how I wanted to be accepted. And now I'm an outsider again. I sort of got over that. And then she added, and you're a primitive. I didn't say that. Your wife said that. Yes. She said, I'm an outsider and I'm a primitive. And so, you know, outsider is one thing, but primitive, I got this image of. Should I come dress as a caveman today? Well, what about a gorilla suit? Okay. Now, I know there are people here who know what a primitive is in the context of art. It is somebody who makes paintings, and when they're making the painting or the art, they don't think, how would Picasso do it? Or how would Matisse? Or how would any other famous artist do it? They just go and paint, and uh, they come up with all the ideas themselves. And people who are primitives really never went to school to study art. So, all right. so it's really a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm happy with it all. And outsider artists are, some of them make a fortune. There are people who love outside art. Now, when I make a painting, as Katerina says, I, well, what I'm doing here is I have taken a look at California's climate plan. It has six goals, all right? They're not all easy to understand. And I have painted, before I came here, three of the goals, including Safeguard California, which Katerina was kind to display here and have a lovely audience. And she had one of her facts off. It was not 15 feet by six. It was 20 feet by six. And Katerina has been very kind to me. and. She has said to me, how do you come up with ideas for painting goals? I think she said, I don't know a single artist in the world who thinks about painting goals. And I'll just mention first quickly how I did Safeguard California. There are four zeitgeists, spirit thoughts that are traveling throughout the world. You are exposed to every one of them. And I see those spirit thoughts as sort of like principles that we should address and think about any situation that we encounter to help us make wise decisions for our time. One is adaptation. So I thought about how could I make a painting, and it's not this one, where I articulated adaptation. You know, we have to adapt, you know, the weather is going to get so rough and adapt. We want to get in our cars, our trucks, our planes, and get out of the way, okay? And then another one is resilience. Resilience is prepare for the hits and to be able to spring back from them. And so I painted resilience. And then here's one that all of you definitely know, sustainability. In, in the painting I made on uh, Safeguard California, I painted sustainability. 
And the way I did it, by the way, is I made a gigantic infinity sign. That is the best symbol for articulating sustainability. And then the last zeitgeist is mitigation. And mitigation is if you see a threat coming at you, and if you cannot do something to be sustainable, to be able to spring back from that hit, or to get out of the way adaptation, then you do as Don Quixote did, mitigation. You go out and fight that threat and weaken it. So that's how I paint these goals. I try to find thoughts. I, I tap into literature. I tap into history, the theater, whatever, to make them. Now, this is the fourth goal of California's six climate change plans, plan that I decided to paint. And that goal is to double the energy efficiency savings at existing buildings. You know, there's billions of buildings around the world, and most of them are not as efficient as they should be. So I was thinking, how in the world would I paint that goal and in a way that brought attention to California's goal, double the energy efficiency savings at existing buildings. And so I'm talking to some folks at Stanford, and I discover they spent almost a half a billion dollars to implement a new energy system that had important new benefits and qualities. And so I asked the Stanford people if they would like me to paint their new almost a half a billion dollar system. And they, of course, said, of course. So I'm going to briefly explain the old system. And, and by the way, it, it, you, if you think about the challenge of painting a goal like that, you know, it, the answers don't come to you necessarily like that. So I decided a way to approach the problem would be show the old system and the problems with the old system. And then I will show the new system without the same disadvantages of the old system. So the old system had a 20-mile pipe that ran throughout much of the campus, and they pumped steam in it. And the steam went all around the campus, and wherever the heat of that steam identified cold, the heat would jump out of the pipe and attack that coal, coal and make it warmer, okay? So it was a 20-mile pipe. Here it is, going around the building. And to create the steam, they had to go to PG&E. And to me, this is PG&E, <laughs> all right? And PG&E is not necessarily clean energy, okay? And they were making the steam. Here is PG&E helping Stanford make the steam. And the steam comes out and goes all the way around. But, oh, and it also goes in one turbine, which is making the electricity. But that system also produced a tremendous amount of waste heat. And I've been fortunate to hang around with some of the leaders at Stanford and other places, in NASA and whatever, and they all talk about the threat of climate change. I, for the first time, when I worked on this project, did I come across scientists, engineers, etc., that were concerned with waste heat, the heat generated inside of buildings by machinery and people, okay? And it's 
an exorbitant amount of heat. And it goes up, and if you look at the rooftops of a lot of buildings, there's these boxes on the top. Those are devices that are attempting to clean maybe a bit and cool the waste heat before it goes out into the atmosphere. So that heat comes down here, and some of it becomes condensed. It becomes water. And all that water is wasted. And all the money that it took to create all this waste heat is gone. Okay? And at the same time, we have greenhouse gases coming from Stanford's facilities. And those gases are going around the planet, like I'm sure everyone here knows, and locking in the heat and causing global warming and its effect climate change. So, one day, the Stanford people sat down. Here they are. <laughs> and they thought about what they were doing to the community, to the world, and how much money. And I think we all know, those who are associated with Stanford know Stanford likes money. I mean, they really do. And, and they said, we got to do something about this. And they came up, and by the way, I think it's uh, Tuesday, the man, you know, I forget the plans and all, Joe Stegna, the man who came up with the idea for this new system, and I see Ken is shaking your head, so you obviously know something about this. He came up with this plan, and I'll go into the plan soon, and he presented it to top management. He's an executive. He's the head of the entire energy system, hi Murray, of the whole place. So he's quite high up. However, this, the plan he had, as I mentioned, was relatively unreported, the kind of technology, and he wanted to push it further than anyone else did. And the board of directors said, uh-uh, hey, you want us to spend all this money on this new system, and we need more proof than just you, Joe, that this is a good idea. Now, I think this is very important. So they contacted the largest energy company of France, Electricity of France, and they said, we want your experts to come here and vet Joe's plan. So who comes but the chairman of Electricity of France, the ambassador from France to the United States, and maybe they had an, ent they had an entourage, and they studied Joe's system, and they blessed it. And I'll come back to that point, and if I forget, help me. And so they decided to build this system, and they started with the same 20-mile pipe that was pumping steam. Now, to create steam, it costs a lot of money. It's a lot less expensive to just make hot water. Okay? And so they upgraded that one pipe so that it could send hot water all around the campus. And wherever that hot water went, and it sensed the need for heat out of the pipe, in effect, jumps the heat and it zaps the cold. Okay? Coal does not go to heat. Heat goes to coal. And then they said, let's put another pipe in, another 20-mile pipe that pumps cold water all around the building and wherever there is a need to cool something down, a building, a room, some equipment. As, these, as this cold water goes around, it sucks out heat. Yeah. The heat jumps out of the, out of the building and partially warms that cold water. And that's pretty much the heart of the system. Two Massive piping systems, one with hot water, one with cold water. And then it gets a little interesting. When this, let's take the 
hot. As the hot goes up, here we have six, six little boxes that represent the start of the cycle. And as it goes along, it gives up heat. We have four up there. And we still have four because there's no more building in the way. And as it continues, the heat starts losing temperature. Okay? And it comes around to this point over here. And what Stanford did was they built some gigantic tanks that they filled with water. And then they used some electricity from PG&E to create hot water. And then they built some tanks. They filled them with water. And they used PG&E services and some other services to make ice water, cold water. Okay? And as these pipes go along to get more heat, they simply they do two things. One, on a busy day, they take more hot water out of this tank, and we now have hot water again. This is like a battery. It's like a battery. But as you know, batteries are not that effective at this point in time in terms of storing energy. But so they pack this with hot water, and they put more hot water in when they need to do it. And then they do something that's sort of like magic. They have invested in these things called heat pumps and chillers. And as the ice water comes back, back around like this, the ice water, compared to something else, has heat in it. So they have these heat pumps and chillers that pull out the heat in the ice water, you know, which is not so icy any longer. They pull that heat out and they stick it in, in the hot pipe. Okay? So they have two methods of getting hot water when they need it and, and cold water when they need it. They get them from here and here. And they also use heat pumps and chillers to pull heat from one type, one of these to the other. And then they also put an AI system in, artificial intelligence system, which keeps track of what's going on here and here and a few other places and up there. They track the weather. And if it's going to be if the forecasts are it's going to be very hot, they step up the electricity and the heating or the cooling of the ice water. And if it's going to be very cold, they make more hot water to meet the needs. So I decided, after I figured out the system, <laughs> and uh, I decided to make this painting that articulated, as best I could, the phenomena of Stanford's energy system. And what I've tried to do is make a painting. I, you know, I, I know this painting will go around to a lot of places. and You'll chuckle when I tell you where it's going next. But this Stanford system serves as a model for every campus or district type building system really in the world. Uh, and if great numbers of companies that have multiple buildings, and it could be as few as three or four buildings, if they embrace this kind of district energy, campus energy solution, they will all succeed in reducing the amount of emissions they are putting out, they will reduce their energy costs, their water costs, they will increase their energy efficiency, and all of us will be a lot better for that. Where does this painting go now? Well, first of all, Katerina, who says I don't make fine art, and by the way, 
I know I don't make fine art, and it is by no means a goal of mine. I make message art that interprets important phenomena for the benefit of uh, suppliers of these kind of systems, communities, and nonprofits. So she did not offend me in the East. I'm a message artist. And where does it go next? When Katarina says, you can have the painting back on a particular date, I send a little message to Stanford. The next day they send a truck. This baby goes over to Stanford and the details have not been worked out what they're, what they're going to do with it in the short term, but it is booked at Stanford for an event. And that event is on June 21, and it's in the Arriaga Alumni Conference Center. And for those who went to Stanford know that is a, like a palatial place. This painting will be, when you walk into the lobby for the Silicon Valley Energy Summit at Stanford. I think this will be the ninth year in a row, or something like that, that they put on that event. This painting will be on the, in the lobby of the Ariaga. No other paintings will be in there. And when they hand out the program to the 400 VIPs that are expected at that event, they will have this photo on the back jacket of the event. And by the way, that's not a big deal for me. <laughs> this will be the seventh year in a row Stanford has been kind to honor me and to put one of my 20-foot paintings, one of my 24-foot paintings, one of my fifth, oh, several of my 15-foot paintings at that event. This will be about the seventh year in a row. And again, this one is new and I still have some cleaning up, but I've been very fortunate. Uh, a few of the organizations, well, first of all, I have to share this. When I started painting, uh, I didn't make anything as big as this, as this one little panel. And I think around the time I made my 16th painting, I was shocked. I got two telegram, two emails one afternoon on a Sunday. They were from the United States government. And I said, huh, what are they contacting me for? I didn't open them for a couple of days. When I open it up, it says, this is NASA. We are building the most energy efficient building in the entire fen federal government, the most advanced in the federal government. And it's gonna be at Moffitt. It's gonna be called Sustainability Base. And there is no jurying. There was no equivocation. They said, we selected you to make a painting for that building. Again, the building was sustainability based. I went there. Again, you know, I'm just a beginning artist. I <laughs> haven't made anything even as... And I said to the number two man of the organization, what's the feeling you want from a painting? And he said that we went out in space and only we could do this. We looked down at Earth and we saw Earth was in trouble and we put the money together to build sustainability base and put supercomputers and whatever and to help the planet, help the country. And I said, that's what the feeling you want? And I said, well, I could do it like this. And they said, it's a deal. And so I made for NASA, this was my first major painting, 24 foot long sustainability. And right after that, I made Resilience of America, also 24 feet. And then I decided to focus, uh, I forget what I've really done, but then I got involved with the state of California. And uh, a few of the organizations that have displayed my art, I've only been doing this for 13 years, I think this is my 13 year, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, the Department of U.S. Economy, the Department of the Interior, NASA three times, Stanford seven or eight times. And with that, I want to say thank you for um, 
the opportunities to share these, these points. And I'm happy to take questions, <laughs> qu make them easy questions. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Bob. What is the projected savings in this system versus the old system? Well, it's got to be more than double. And I want to say, Joe Stegner is going to be here. He has reams and reams of data. The other day, I asked him in an email, Joe, give me the up-to-date statistics on it. And he hasn't responded. You, know, that's, he'll, you come back, Joe will tell you. He'll stay here all night to talk about his, his great account. Oh, thank you very much. I am getting dry. Thank you very much. Second question. What's the current state of um, concern with PG&A troubles? I think that's an extremely complex topic. And I think uh, Gavin Newsom recently announced in 90 days there will be a plan. But as you know, with bankruptcy, they want to get rid of all the obligations as possible, keep all the assets they can. And one of the most controversial aspects of it, you know, PG&E has it in its head that it wants to shut down the only source of really good clean energy, Diablo Canyon. And I know a lot of people are wondering, is there a way with this bankruptcy that somehow or another Diablo Canyon can be pulled out from under PG&E or PG&E can be forced <coughs> not to shut it down. They, and the only reason they want to shut it down is because of accounting and some rules that allow them to get a windfall, you know, significant increased profits. You know, it's like, I think, a one-time thing, and it makes more sense to shut down for them. Okay, so that's all I can say about PG&E. But I don't know if I mentioned this before. Um, you know, PG&E is gas gas. And I attended a, a speech uh, last year where the president of PG&E was talking. And oh, by the way, they want to build all these new gas plants to back up the renewable energy plants. But in this speech, he said, you know, it's very possible down the road, we will be prohibited from making energy from gas. Okay. Okay. Uh, I can, you had a question? Yes. Um in case you're not here for the Joe Stegner talk, um, we are fortunate enough to be right here that uh, we can go tour this facility. Yes. Stanford puts a tour on, and I was fortunate enough to go on it about two months ago. So that's why this is super exciting to me. And by the way, congratulations. This is a spectacular piece. Thank you. Awesome. That's very kind. And I also, but I don't want to let him get up on the stage because this man is powerful. He will steal the show. But uh, this week, what's coming up, Alex Canara, who is very much on top of what's happening with PG&E, and there he is right there. He is going to be speaking, and, and he's bringing up, I think he's bringing up uh, a vice president from down in the Diablo Canyon area, St. Louis Obispo. He can answer a lot of questions. And then I also noticed there is another outstanding uh, energy analyst here, and that's Rapu Malahotra. Um, raise your hand. He is a former SRI scientist, just like Bob is. And he has done some significant work. For example, he made a book called the cubic, A Cubic Mile of Oil. I tend to value what he and two other authors have done. But I have to give you an, a little example. Some of you have a mathematics background. And you know, we calculate big numbers in the, the system we're all used to using. But when the numbers get really big, it's a good idea to get out of our system and go into logarithms and do the calculations with the logarithms. And then 
come back. And Laplace transformations is like that too. You know, you got some calculations that are difficult to work with. You grab a Laplace transformation and you do your calculations there, and then you transfer back. Papu wrote a book with two men where they took the, these huge energy numbers and they converted them to do the calculation so we can understand and do the calculation. And then they convert back to the systems you and I can deal with. Uh, another question from someone? It, it's an easy one. How long did you, did you spend on it? This one took longer than any painting I have ever undertaken. When I take on one of these, I try to do it in three months. I thought about this for three months before I undertook it. And I want to share what the problem is, why it takes so long. First, I have to articulate the old system, but as you articulate the old system, you have to think about the new system, especially if you want to do some fine art stuff, you know? <laughs> and, and now, I, so I want to show you, share this with you. When I start putting this line here, or, or this line, or whatever, I have to think about how the lines here will line up with the lines over here. And that reminds me, um, I think Tuesday, I guess it is, the vice president of um, electricity of France is going to speak. And I don't know if he's the vice president of a research organization, you know, the French, and they are documenting Stanford system, you know, the French are. The French are coming. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he came to my house recently, and apparently he looked at some of my other art, and he said, look at the structure here, Michael. It's an infinity sign. It is an infinity sign. And so it took three months for me to think about the structure and like uh, there are simple little things like, you see how the how this comes. This this line comes all the way down here, and and here's another main line that comes like this. Okay, so I had to figure out the old system, and figure out how to lay it out so that there was an overall structure and that it would then, you know, and if you take a look at Picasso's Guernica, and yes, I said I don't think about other artists' work, but about my ninth painting ever, I decided to repaint Picasso's Guernica. You know, you've got to be a little crazy. And I noticed Picasso's structure was very much like this. He came right up and right down. And when I looked at that painting, Guernica, that's I think 10 foot by 20 feet, but I didn't make it as big as that. I really got involved with the structure of things. And so three months and then another three months. And uh, thank you, Lorena, for inviting me to this. I'm really I think I like the idea of having art to depict an idea or a system. Uh, do you? My question is: Do you take requests? Or uh, one of the things I'm thinking of is that there is a lady in in Sichuan, in uh, southern China, in a jungle forest. Uh, they are clearing it to make tea plantations. So what she did is that she buy up a tribe of jungle, protect it and then have uh, sustainable agriculture underneath it. And those are the systems that could be a good subject for art. I'm just wondering if you take requests and how, how that goes. Commissions, Michael, commissions. Yeah. 
for me. Yes. Yes, I have. I have already told the Frenchman, he's Dutch but French, that's going to speak here next week, that it would be to the benefit of the French government in doing business in the United States if the French government invited me to paint their climate plan. Okay. And a week, uh, I guess two months ago, I did a TV show where we discussed Tom Steyer's framework, voter framework, if I remember correctly, had six five rights. And you were the talk show host. I was. That's Jonathan Clyde. He was the talk show host. I did that show because frameworks really interest me. Voter rights really interest me. And I think Tom Steyer, as I remember, he wanted to drive his framework through the entire Democratic Party and get every candidate and all their supporters buying into each of the rights. So I made that show to send a message that if he'd like me to paint that, I would gladly do it. Now, I, yes, people come to me. They have to be big projects, challenging projects, and be likely no one else would undertake, to be honest, and, and be of great benefit to everyone. Yes, sir. Thank you, George. I, I, I missed the beginning of the, of, of the conversation, so well, hopefully I'm not making you repeat something. But if you were to summarize within, let's say, a one minute, why this system is more effective than that system, well, why, how would you summarize it? Well, this system wasted a tremendous amount of energy and it sprued out into the environment a tremendous amount of pollution that, that month, some of it circles the earth and causes the earth to warm and the impact of climate change. This system does not emit anywhere near from what I can determine of the harmful gases and it is, doesn't spend, they don't spend the same amount of money by any means on energy. That, and the fundamental approach is, is a lot uh, different. Here, you are relying on the grid, PG&E, to burn a tremendous amount of gas to give you the heat you need to make a fundamental property of this system, which is steam, go around the building. The, you don't need the same amount by far to heat some hot water, store, store it until you need it, and some cold water. You just don't need as much energy and money to do that. And I'm still looking for the greenhouse gases that this system Emits. Okay, I'd like to go back to George's question uh, about China. And uh, it made me think a little bit about the last two goals of California's climate plan that I have not tackled. But before I get to your point, one of them I don't like. It is to double the renewable energy capability of the state. The answer is not in doubling the renewable energy. It's, they're missing the mark. It is to significantly increase the amount of clean energy this state and the planet needs. But the, I was looking at the other one that I haven't painted yet, and it's to, it's something like uh, more productively use working land, you know, to reduce the greenhouse gases. And, at first pass, you know, that's pretty straightforward for me. You know, it's all farming and maybe some mining and a few other things. But you make me a little bit more interested 
in uh, that kind of application. And I don't know anything about it, but that's like normal with me. And then I just want to say a little ego thing. When I was a young man, very young, I got a telegram and I was informed I would be on a five-man team, five-person team, to go to Beijing, go to China, and to tour the universities that were teaching computer science, and then to go to the head of the Academy of Sciences and to tell him what we saw. And really, I got the job of articulating how China should change its approach to the education of computer science. And I went to the Chaotong University, the Beijing University, and the Nanking. And it was at the time, it was one year after Nixon and Kissinger worked with Deng Xiaoping. The, the point is, I take on projects. Oh, and I never went to class to study computer science. I never. <laughs> anyway. I, look, I put the last piece of paint on this, I don't know what time last night. <laughs> I really don't. And I was going to get my wife's hair dryer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll put my signature on it tonight or tomorrow. Uh, Rapu, yes. One comment. I have seen earlier versions of this painting. Boy, what a difference. This is amazingly Many, many times more beautiful than what, I, what you had showed me previously. Good. Thank and much better articulated. It's, it's an evolution. And I also want to share, I caught Rapu on multiple occasions. He's come into my studio with a Sharpie pen, and he has written 20 billion tons of greenhouse gases. Actually, I've asked him to do that. OK. And there's something about. I think making art, but it's also, I think, applies to making business reports, whatever. You know, it's an evolution. You don't really know what you're really going to do when you start, but you've got to start. And, and you want to get the mistakes over with as soon as possible. And you don't want to make any firm <laughs> commitment, you know, in the structure or whatever until you pretty much worked it out. And, you know, I knew I had to have AI in this, this painting. And I think it was yesterday I decided to put this in, to give it a little human aspect of it. Uh, you know, it's an evolutionary process. And I would say, Two weeks from now, it'll be slightly better. <laughs> and, oh, and now I'd just like to announce one of my models is here. And one of my assist, well, several of my assistants are here. And Asia is a great help. Lorena is another great helper of mine. And then would my model and my assistant painter please come up here? <laughs> This is uh, Isabella, my dear, sweet, lovable granddaughter. And when she was a little younger, she used to come over and help me with my paintings. And she used to get a dollar and a half a minute just to stand like this for me. And then, you know, I did a painting that included the expression, send in the clowns. You, you know what that is expression means when we have screwed up something so badly in our family or whatever and there is no recovering from it you send in the clowns and we made a painting you know, one of these paintings like this and we needed some clowns because send in the clowns and she did the clowns mm -hmm. thank you for getting here love you do have a seat all right i think you're probably getting restless and I want to say thank you, and Katerina, thank you for allowing me to be here again. And I'll see you with the next painting.
the yeah. real smart people will be here next week. <laughs> Thank you for coming.